It's had the book by uh, Kennedy, Leiter, and Rogers. It's People Money. There's a dis nice description of very many uh, professionally managed systems. Uh, not all of the organizers are well paid. It, in fact, it's often it's also voluntary work. But uh, that raises, uh, makes more acute the question of the financial basis of this uh, of these organizations. Um, I did not any empirical uh, research on my own. I just collected bits and pieces, um, bits and pieces from existing uh, existing. Uh, collected bits and pieces from other studies. And, um, uh, one example was, a very good example is the study by Georgina about the Argentinian uh, Twitter system. It has a more, a wider approach. It does not just look at the financial aspects, but in fact this empirical studies contains um, plenty of material about the, in particular, about the Trueca systems, like the RGT system, which one can say that from a financial point of view, was financially flawed. Yeah? Uh, they saw these little, this paper money, and uh, charged a fee for it, seeing a rush, but that made it attractive to get more and more members, but uh, they failed actually to build up structures. The money was not really used uh, to um, actually uh, build up a sustainable organization. And later, they, I think they realized that um, the concept itself was, was wrong, and they tried to introduce a, a demorage, which proved to be far too complex. People didn't understand that. So one could also say that's a good example of a system which, just from a financial point of view, uh, was not well designed, to take up the term used this morning. Uh, paper currencies in general are a little bit tricky to administer. We have now the also more empirical ev evidence. Amy Kirchner, for instance, writes, paper currencies are expensive and hard to administer. Lack of success was supposed to be some combination of organizational factors. In fact, all this struggles with stuffing, funding, circulation, and membership all stemmed from how the currency was put in circulation. So uh, uh, with regard to this uh, empirical contribution, one could say, uh, let's be careful with regard to paper currency. It's also a cost factor. Uh, I mentioned the book by uh, Rogers and John Rogers and others. Uh, presented, of course, is also the uh, Kingauer, the famous German Regogeld uh, system. Uh, still, um, it's, uh, it depends mainly on voluntary work. The last uh, statistics, they produce very nice annual statistics, and this indicates that 65% of the input is, uh, which carries the system is based on voluntary work. In addition, there are 5% donations, and the rest is uh, income derived uh, from, from the fees they get. Um, the Kingo, I think, is a very interesting example because uh, they try to be self-sustainable uh, and not to become financially dependent. Uh, but it's, I, I have my doubts whether this is a good model because they are doing so marvelous organizational work uh, which cannot be replicated elsewhere in other radio gelt system. At least that's what the experience in, in Germany tells us. Um, they, I think they have now something 3,000 something members. And um, when the movement uh, started in 2004, 2005, uh, Kennedy and Dieter wrote, um, one has to have at least 10,000 members, 10,000 to one million members. That was about the expectation. So even with regard to the Kingauer, there is, uh, well, room for improvement, uh, not to speak of the other systems. Uh, more members would mean more uh, income, but so far they didn't achieve it. Yeah. That's a problem. Other models um, relied heavily on subsidies. Uh, I have one example in the paper 
in Eastern Germany, uh, it's called the Dessauer. It's an interesting model which comprised a private to private circle, a business to private circle, and a private to private, uh, 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 business to business uh, uh, element, a barter element. Um, it was uh, heavily subsidized. They received uh, millions of euros over a period of, I'm not sure, three years or something. But uh, when the uh, subsidies came to an end, the project came to an end. It was not possible to, uh, to uh, continue it. And by now there are plenty of experiences of that kind. I'm almost tempted to say, when I, whenever I see the European flag on, a, on the website of a project, it's a kind of a bye-bye flag to a project. Because uh, from experience I would say, well, they don't really manage to uh, build up financially sustainable projects. Um, that's with regard to the financial uh, uh, sustainability, but um, I would like to uh, focus in my presentation on a balanced uh, view of sustainability, focusing on all three parts, ecological, social, and economic uh, uh, sustainability. And this part is about uh, uh, ecological and uh, social sustainability. Um, Normally, complementary or community currencies have a very yeah, positive connotation. They are presented as part of the social and solidarity economy. Um, may I remind you, that's not always the case. Uh, I myself, I did research about the Tauschzentralen. These were the well-spread systems in Germany and Austria in the 40s. And uh, they were developed all already at, at the time of the Nazi regime. They were not really an offspring of the Nazi regime, but uh, uh, somehow one could say they were a small regime in the war economy of this uh, system. Uh, later, they were uh, developed by the uh, Allied uh, forces in Germany. Even the Russians, they also adopted them after some hesitation. So they were useful, a useful alternative to the black market at that time. Um, but that's one example. Or well, the most really dirty example uh, is a system in South Africa, and that's for whites only. So it's a, it's a, it's a racist uh, uh, system. These people use the complementary currencies. And, um, it's, it's not a big risk that this uh, it will be well spread, this idea, idea fortunately. But um, I think these systems are so flexible that they can apply it in different social contexts. And we have evidence also uh, with regard to the application of neoliberal policies, uh, with regard to Australia, with regard to uh, New Zealand. And um, it's it remains to be seen what happens with the time banks in the UK. I have no detailed information about this, but uh, let's see whether this will be the case also in the UK. I think one has to be careful in respect uh, of this issue. Um, another point is uh, many of the, just the big projects are top-down solutions. Um, now, I have nothing in general against top-down solutions. When I worked as a Tauschrank organizer, well, of a small Tauschrank in Germany, I could not go in one of the difficult neighborhoods in Hanover. Uh, that would be the task of, a, say, a time bank yeah, with a social worker. And yeah, I would understand that's good to, to have a top-down solution there. But I'm critical with regard to uh, models and systems which are, pl are applied in a, in a, uh, in a uh, general for the general public, it raises the question, who is the carrier of sustainability? Who is deciding what is sustainability? When you get just the points and say, well, uh, uh, I collect some garbage, and then you get some point. Uh, in smaller systems, you are the carrier of the decisions uh, to decide what is sustainability. Um, that's, I think, another point. And, um, well, with regard to new legislation, I think the relative success of complementary currencies um, 
becomes evident now in this time would require new legislation that we see in many contributions at this conference. But this opens the gate also for dangerous uh, developments, the developments which I see in a very critical way. Uh, say, for instance, uh, uh, Bernard Lieter mentions miles and more, and uh, uh, Hugo Gottschalk mentioned that also yesterday as a very interesting design. But it would be possible to say if there are uh, business to private rings, let's say Walmart is introducing uh, and paying its workers with a uh, uh, with the corporate currencies, and they can then do the shop shopping just within the ring of companies involved there. That's, I think, uh, something where one has to be very careful. Um, with regard to the, the costs incurred, uh, it's not, from a financial point, it's not that complex. The task is really to cover current costs. New technology might be helpful, but I'm skeptical that they can really, uh, uh, it will be possible to, to create systems where, where everything will be automized. Uh, plenty of reorganization and work is, uh, is, yeah, has to be done manually, so to say. Uh, it's, it's very labor intensive. Uh, therefore, I think self-financing, that's what Ken Lee and wrote in 2004, self-financing is the key to sustainability. Um, that's an important point. But the trouble then is, if we look at overall transaction costs, um, including also the burden to be carried by members of a system, uh, it's uh, difficult for them to pay higher fees. Yeah? A member uh, may join a system, and then they realize, OK, there's a hairdresser, but the hairdresser is in another part of the city. So I have to go traveling there, and uh, the hairdresser next door well, he doesn't want to join because he has to introduce uh, a new bookkeeping system. This is the wider uh, uh, view on, on transaction costs. And that's, that's a crucial point in my, in my paper, is, I think, uh, the reason why these uh, systems weren't able to really take off, to uh, actually uh, uh, get off the ground. That's what organizers like the Christian Gallery, for instance, and expected. They had hoped to, that a, a self-enhancing process would be uh, triggered off. And uh, it was not just like a bird swarm. It, uh, it, uh, it, it simply didn't happen. In order to overcome this, I think uh, it is necessary, from my point of view, not just to look at the monetary aspects, but also to the embeddedness of social systems. There are many contributions in respect of this issue in the literature, like by Georgina. But um, there is a gap, I think, of theoretical, conceptual work. And my suggestion is here to focus on boundaries. I have a few examples here that uh, complementary or community currencies can be defined as systems that operate within boundaries, spatial boundaries, and a variety of different other boundaries. Complementary currency means um, there's a distinctive uh, zone, a distinctive boundary, a line perhaps, to the established euro currency, yen, or whatever. Uh, and we have this as a practical problem. Is it a, a, a cur currency which is non-convertible, or as in the case of the King Gao, where uh, convertibility is limited? An interesting case is the uh, fatal mark. Uh, that's the oldest existing system, uh, uh, I, at least I know. It was founded in, in 1908. It operates in the, uh, within a psychiatric hospital. It exists today, still today, as uh, Betel Euro, it's called now. And in 1931 or 1932, when uh, many uh, systems were ruled to be illegal, um, the authorities decided, well, you get an exception because this currency operates just within the uh, uh, boundaries of this institution. So that's an argument, I think, with regard to, uh, to also to the legislative process. I think this uh, consideration could be uh, uh, a theoretical framework 
to analyze uh, systems in general, to provide a broader framework for uh, complementary currencies. Um, it's, uh, some authors have taken it up to the, uh, also in, in the context of, of complementary currencies. And of course, there's plenty of discussion of creating new boundaries in the literature in, uh, in general. But uh, I have to hurry up, so I can't tell you now anything more about this. Uh, yeah, that's just the one point I like to focus on. Money creates links and boundaries separate. There's a certain distinction. It's important to understand it. It doesn't always have to be in line, but um, um, and maybe a boundary zone, yeah, where you say, okay, there's, uh, systems are overlapping. Um, but uh, this consideration is important, perhaps also with regard to the creation of new systems. And here yeah, I have uh, an example, um, something published already back in, in 1989. Um, uh, that was a model was where uh, someone proposed that uh, a model, a scenario in fact, not a blueprint, something to be put directly into practice, but to, uh, uh, um, yeah, to motivate us to, to uh, trigger up more creativity in this process. The idea was that transactions within a regional area would be exempted from uh, tax, from income tax and VAT. Um, so that would, in fact, lower transaction costs. And instead, uh, people, participants in the system uh, were uh, charged with a levy which financed the organization of the system. Um, in addition, there was also a time boundary, uh, not just a regional boundary. Uh, in fact, the, uh, this fiscal privileges applied only in as far as uh, supply and demand was balanced over uh, a certain period, over a year. If somebody generated a surplus, uh, at the end, uh, the authorities would say, no, you have to pay the taxes and the levy, yeah, and the other way also around. This is interesting because it also provides a solution to the problem of imbalance between supply and demand, which is faced by many closed-loop systems. Uh, it's a way uh, to get out of it. In fact, it's a subsystem of the uh, existing capitalist market. And, of course, it also provides uh, 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 solution to the uh, financial dilemma faced by complementary currencies. But, uh, okay, I'm almost finished. That's the final words. Uh, uh, no, no rose without thorns, I have to say. There are other problems coming up, like arbitrage. It makes, uh, makes it attractive to trick the systems. And, uh, uh, but I think it's, it's worthwhile to think about uh, these possibilities. Uh, well, uh, my conclusion is we should not just focus on financially high-powered systems, but uh, work on different tracks. Yeah? Don't forget the small-scale systems, like uh, time banks, uh, Tau Schwinger, or whatever. Um, uh, try to think about financially viable systems, about uh, subsidies which uh, also allow democracy as an important element, and uh, well, keep open-minded with regard to solutions which perhaps a little bit are still above the clouds. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, five minutes, two or three questions maybe, and Jen. we go on in this time. Jen, can you turn on the aircon? Aircon, sure. Uh, uh, the other one.
Um, yeah, alternate, I think it's important to search for alternative sources of funding. There's a very interesting paper by Jérôme Blanc and Marie Fare published earlier this year, and they focus very much on the uh, system La Collerie in Quebec. And, uh, well, then they try to apply it in France, but it's not generally applicable because in France they have these traditional uh, cooperatives which are still open-minded with regard to this kind of experiments. Yeah? Um, and prepared to, to provide, hopefully, long-term funding and uh, uh, are able to support uh, uh, grassroots movements which are also democratically organized. But one has to f look for niches. Quick, quick follow-up. Are, are there been any instances where people have raised private capital to, to make these things happen? Are there any, any deals that you've known in the past that have came out? Yes. Um, I know that some people have supported the system from private sources, but uh, I'm not really uh, able to to mention any any uh, uh, sources. The commercial, like the bank in America. Yes, the, the commercial base. That's that's a different story. Yes. We have this conception of the territory, which is we understand that like a, a social construction of a multi-dimensional collective space where economic and social activities are located. So it's a system made up of actors who are linked together by social relations. It's a really bottom-up approach, and we we apply this vision to to the. Uh, Palmas currency, which is a currency made by the first community development bank in Brazil, the Bank Farmers. For the ones who don't know, the community development banks in Brazil are financial and social tools, institutions in poor territories, and they develop like uh, financial tools as microcredit, uh, social currencies, currency connect banking and micro investments and also social tools like capacity building and, uh, and trainees. Well, the framework, the theoretical framework of this analysis is were made by Maifa, it's his PhD thesis, and she analyzed that the CCs has the potential, have potential to uh, stimulate uh, territorial development by first territorialization of activities, to boosting exchanges, and three, uh, change, uh, changing social practices and representations. So we will analyze the Palmas currency within this framework. First of all, Palmas currency has a strong impact of the territorialization of activities because it creates a, a solidarity community. But this solidarity community was not created by the, the, the Palmas currency. It was created before, because the uh, Bank Palmas is inside the, the, 
the Conjunto Palmeiras, which is a, a, a neighborhood in the, in the big city of Fortaleza, which is the fourth biggest city in Brazil, and it's a really poor area. The first inhabitants were there, transported there in 1971, 73, and there was nothing, but nothing at all, only palmas trees. So the, the first inhabitants has to, had to, to, uh, to construct everybody, everything by, by themselves. So, so they, they did like a mutual, uh, sorry, I need to, uh, well, they, 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 they constructed, they unified themselves to construct the first houses and to, to fight against the local authorities to, to have access to, to health, water, education, and there, there was just like a really social movement inside the, the, the territory. So the, the cooperation logic was before the, the, uh, the Palmas currency, but was at the origin of the creation of the Palma, Palmas Bank. And the Palmas Bank uses, uses uh, the active participation of all the members of the community. For instance, when they want to, because they make some microcredit, but when they want to, to give a microcredit, the, the borrower uh, needs to give his address and the Bank of Palmas sees the neighborhood to, to see to consult the neighbors of the borrower to know uh, if he's trustfully or not and to know, so it's, it's really inside the a, a, a trust uh, framework of the, of the territory and uh, there's a, there's a incentive uh, participation of all the members. And also the Palmas Bank is, 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 has done a space for collective deliberation, which is called FICOL, which is economical, uh, local economical forum, inside which everybody can participate, like inhabitants, businesses, institutions, and it's like a, a, a space where everybody deliberates to say, we need that, for improving their daily life. And, and, and the Palmas Bank is doing some products, financial and social products, uh, based on the needs expressed in the FICOL. So all these instruments and social capital uh, create and continue uh, stimulating the, the solidarity community which has a really strong impact on the territorialization of activities because it makes like a community. So, we, as Palmas currency has a, a really good impact on the internalization of the, the conception inside the Conjunct Palmeiras. In 1997, uh, only 20% of the households consumed inside the, the, the neighborhood. But while this rate had, had risen to uh, 93% in 2011, as you can see, uh, 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 Zbonko Palmas was created in 1988, uh, uh, so one year after the, the first survey of the reception in the, in the neighborhood. So we can see that it, it's this institution, the local institution, made inverted the, the, the trains, the conception trains inside the uh, the Palmeiras. So it's the it's, it, it creates more internalization of the conception and so activities, economic activities. As Bank Palmas also incubates some social solidarity based enterprises, which is uh, like cooperatives. Actually they make some groups to, to uh, invite them to create and to produce some, some goods, more goods than services. And now only two of those uh, solidarity-based enterprises are still working. It's the Palma Fashion, which is a textile enterprise, and uh, Palma Tour, which is uh, uh, like an hostel for, for, for selling tourists. The, 
two, uh, second point of the territorialization of the activities is stimulating exchanges and so boosting exchanges. So the Bank Palm has created a new impetus to trade by, by implementing new mechanisms of, of monetary circulation. The first one was a Palma card, which is a <coughs> manual credit card. So it was made in, in 1988, I think, at the beginning of the, 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 the creation of the bank, to, to give more, more, more access to, to, to the poor people, to provide access to a medium of exchange to those who are despised, who were uh, deprived of it. So it was the first, the first uh, monetary tool created by the bank. And uh, the Palmas currency, as we know today, and you will see a picture on the next slide, uh, one of the ways to have access to, to, to this currency is by buying micro credit for consumption. So we can have three ways of, having, of issuing this currency, which is micro credit for consumption, paying the, the, the wages of the, the workers of the Palmas, and um, redeeming uh, AIs for, 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 for pounds. So one of the ways of having the currency is an access to microcredit, which is an incentive to consume inside the community and also boost exchanging because it gives more, 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 more currency and so exchanges. And so also the, the, in, in 2012, uh, 230 and 30 microcredits for consumption were, were issued for a total of uh, 33,000 pounds. As I said, they also give some microcredit for production, which is actually the most, the, the core of the activities of the bank. And it's, 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 uh, it's the middle of credit almost uh, 4,000 4, last year to, to enhance uh, the local economy and to, to give more, to boost the production capacities of the, the territory. Okay, I will go quickly. Uh, but there is a, a problem, which is, uh, well, the, the, the currency is widely accepted in, in the community since there are like 250 uh, businesses who accept it. But uh, we can see a strong polarization of the, the, the flows of the currency since the currency is when it's issuing uh, most of the times it's taken by, by employees by wages or by loads and when it goes back to, to, to the bank for redeeming uh, it's, 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 uh, it's almost the, uh, the fuel pump was, was changing almost everything actually okay so really concentrated. The third uh, aspect of the territorialization of the activity is the change of social practices and representations. As we saw in the first part, citizens, uh, there is a citizen reappropriation of the economy and the territorial development since the inhabitants and businesses are always consulate, uh, consultated to, to participate and to design the, the, the development they want. So they become directly involved in the territory and empowered in that way because they are always stimulated. And there is also a Palmatech, uh, which is like the community school. They provided some trainees and, uh, and trainees. And one of the on, of the one of the examples of the, the, the programs uh, uh, Palmas gives it's uh, Ellis, which is a project of. Uh, Capacity building for, for women, poor women receiving the uh, Bolsa Familia, which is a huge uh, uh, cash transfer program in Brazil. Uh, uh, it helps, the, it gives an access to loans to, to credit for, for these women and give more, more, uh, say that, it helps them to construct their own socio productive activity and to give them educational, uh, no, financial and banking education. Well, but 
So we, we, we saw that the Bank of Palmas, the Consul Palmeiras, Bank of Palmas, and Moeda Palmas has a strong impact on the territorialization of activities. But there is also a symbolic role of the Palmas. And so the, the, the currency is a symbol of the reappropriation of the territory. Since it belongs to the territory, it's a symbol of the common project that we saw. And has the, the name of the currency, Palmas, which we referred to the Palmas trees before, uh, before the first innovators arrived, uh, it's, it's a clear uh, <coughs> belonging to the territory. And also the iconography, since there are like Palmas trees on the, the, the currency. And 95% of respondents believe that the action of the Bank Palmas and its presence uh, in the territory have improved the, the image of the community. This is really, really <coughs> important actually because uh, it's, a, it's a suburb, it's a really violent, it was a really, well, still, a really violent uh, neighborhood. So the medias were there when they talk about this uh, neighborhood, they always say it's, it's violence, it's crime, it's, it's, it's really <coughs> difficult. But now with the Bank of Palmas, a lot of people come, like academics, like practitioners, like uh, also medias, and this give a really positive image of the community, which helps them to have more self-esteem and, and, and better the image of the community. And the currency helps in that way. So, it's a symbol of the mobilization of actors, stakeholders, and community building. These currencies uh, helped in uh, raising consciousness by educational pedagogy and awareness to territorial development. Uh, and now, last uh, last uh, month, uh, Bank Palmas did this this uh, currency, which is Palminas. This is a currency for for children. It's a really low low amount, like ten. Sense, which is really low, and it enable it give uh, it enable children to, to, to pay for educational tools or, or sweets or something like that. And it's it's it this currency is building a bridge between the generations to to sensitize the new generation to the fights they did, to the struggle, to the all the past they did till now to construct the the neighborhood. And this is a, a, a yeah, this is a, one of the project, currency project of the, of the Palmas. It's also made a, 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 the currency for, for the, the World Cup next year. Uh, they made that, and they want to make a museum project of uh, all the currencies inside the Palmas and also outside. But because the Bank Palmas created a model, a new model of community bank with a its own strategy as we define here and we, we, we this 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 project now this this model is imp implemented in more than 100 uh, communities inside Brazil so it's a really huge and innovative uh, model and, and phenomenon in, in, in Brazil so they also want to take all the currencies of, of those, those communities so yeah, because the currency is is so you now the, the social link, social link between generations, social link between actors, and, and creating cooperation and, and territorial cohesion. So to conclude, we can say that the success of the farmers is primarily determined determined by changes in economic behavior, as we saw the trends, consumption trends inside the, the neighborhood. And it's a mobile, mobilization tools, tool for uh, of local actors by activating different forms of proximity, networking of actors, creating chains of production and consumption, also in micro credit, product and micro credit, and planning with all the participation of the, the, the actors. Uh, so the CC can be considered as a common good since it belong to the community and since it's, it's, uh, the rules are defined by the community and all the actors. 
and uh, both partners. Actually, it has an institute now, and the institute is in charge of uh, expanding the, the, the model in both of the country. So the institute partners have the support of CINICE, which is a uh, national secretary of Solidarity Economy, uh, for assisting the development of both partners, but also all the other community development banks. But uh, there is no specific legal status to those organizations. It's really strange, actually. It's, it's paradoxical that it, it's like that. And sometimes municipalities use uh, community currencies and uh, community development banks as an instrument to public policies. So it's really social, socio-economic inclusion to promote socio-economic inclusion and territorial development. So, so the bank partners, as we saw, it has this currency and the community development bank helped in the territorialization is a de territorial development. It has a really huge impact and it improved, really improved the, the living conditions in the neighborhood. And this model is now in expansion all the, in all the country and maybe outside in Venezuela, but we don't have so many empirical studies on that. Uh, so it's, it's an important model of uh, social currencies. Thank you for your attention. So once again, a few questions. I don't really know if they are really regulating. Re 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 they, they are making law for the banks. Actually, they were has had some some uh, they tried to make it in the parliament, but they didn't really manage to make a law. So they they, they have a recognition of the central bank. Uh, it's more than tolerance, actually, because the central bank said it's okay, but it's not really regulated. Such. It's a really, I would say, schizophrenic uh, position. That's why like Marusa isn't here because she's been asked to draft the regulations. Sorry? Marusa Freya oh. is not here because she has been, they wanted her there to draft the regulations. So I was wondering what was motivating the government okay. to introduce this bill. Okay. Yeah, it's. Juliana, maybe you can say a word about that. No, they are trying that. to write a, a law, but it's not only for the community currencies. It's about the community developed banks and small funds that we have in Brazil. So they are doing, it's a law, but it's like, a, it's not a regulation, but more a recognition. Uh, to it's say so this exists, uh, is, uh, is regulated for the Minister of the Justice in Brazil. And because they are social organizations and we have a regulation there, so they are trying to rec recognize saying uh, what it is and what they are doing. Uh, it's not regulated for central bank and anything, but we also. It's a facilitating. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. More Thank you. Than I'll talk to you later. <laughs> yes. How are the notes issued? Are they prepaid against the local, against the national? Currency, or what is the way how to put the, these notes into circulation? Yeah, it's backed with the national currency. Yeah. So people pay it in national currency and they get the notes of the bank as well. Well, uh, what is the process? How are they doing it? Uh, <coughs> the money is issued by by wages 
so the the, uh, the employers of the bank has directly in, in, in the currency. Uh, also microcredit, that's your the question. Also microcredit directly issued by by in Palmas. Uh, the other way is by redeeming. So uh, inhabitants can come and give some reais re and uh, with reais after that they, they fix the uh, Palmas. This is one of the case because in the Palmas, Palmas case was the first one. In the network of the community development banks now, they are, uh, they are doing sometimes differently. Sometimes the, the backing system is um, uh, recyclage, uh, to recycle uh, the, pro the products that people recycle, plastic bottles, etc. So that could be uh, brought to the bank. The bank calculates the volume of the, of the recycled amount uh, of products and uh, issue the, the, the community currency um, with the backing of these, uh, these products that they sell to that the bank sells to uh, some uh, uh, enterprises that collect uh, these products. We have in uh, Sao Paulo uh, also um, this, uh, the community bank as a community currency on the same model than the Palmas Bank and as issued also a cultural currency uh, circulating within uh, the community just to promote cultural uh, activities. Uh, that, that means there are two parallel uh, community currencies running for two different uh, aspects of uh, the community actions. Uh, so now, with the spreading of the model, and as you just to, 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 to explain, as you have seen, the consumption uh, trends uh, have completely been inverted uh, with the action of the the evacuation of the Palmas Bank, then uh, the uh, issuing of the Palmas card, uh, then a uh, tricky club, the bar club that was issued before the Palmas uh, currency uh, began to circulate. Um, now that the, the currency has uh, no more, um, um, it's, it's no, not, more, not um, no more needed in the community because the consumption is, uh, is actually uh, being done locally. So that means the, the, the first objective, uh, principal objective of the currency at the beginning is no more uh, interesting for the, for the bank. So now that we, they are reflecting on what, what the scheme should be or could be to help and grow, um, have the ability to go further than where they have uh, gone so far. That's why there is this Dominion uh, and this World, World Cup uh, currency, uh, because still um, when, you, when they create the community banks, the, the currency is the first step, meaning you have to you have to gather the, the, the wheels, of the energies of the community, and you have to get a symbol, and the, the currency is the first symbol. So it's that's why we, we, we put on the, um, the focus on the symbolic data of uh, the, the the currency because now in the Palmas case it's no no more really circulating um, in comparison to other community currencies here. It has been circulating in the early years. Now it's no more needed because everyone has understood that they had to, to consume locally. So now the, the next step is electronic currency. Uh, they had one experience during one year, uh, a, new current, a new scheme of currency, etc. In the other cases, uh, in the other banks, they are still learning on how to appropriate themselves with the, with the concept and make, make it circulate because all the most of the 100 uh, community banks are very recent. They have created through the budget of the SNIs. They have both SNIs, uh, so that's why. Just we'll, we'll go back and we'll go back if we have more questions after the Georgina's presentation. Because <laughs> she's ready. Thank <laughs> you, bye. Okay. Uh, okay, thanks everybody. Well, my paper is in a very drafty stage. I underestimated the organizational workload of the conference and I couldn't uh, round it up as I wanted. But anyway, uh, you might be asking yourself at this point, why is everybody referring so much to the Argentine case? Why was it so special? The answer quite simply is that it was the biggest. And not just a little bit bigger than any other one, it was a few hundred times bigger than any other one. So this is what makes it so interesting, but there are a few other reasons. And among others is that yes, they also, with the diversity, they also existed in mental hospitals, they also existed in schools, 
there was also the, the market for the little children, there was also the museum, whatever you can invent it in such a big scale, they tried everything. It's also very interesting to, to learn from the lessons of what did not work, which is basically almost everything. <laughs> so I started from this definition. Uh, a CCS is an organization to exchange goods and services within a closed group or a specific space by means of adapting the existent monetary system or constructing one at all. I started researching this topic 10 years ago with this definition and when I went to research in Argentina, one thing that bothered me was why did you call it trueque, which translates literally as barter, and the second thing that is bothering me to this day is why did you call it clubs, and afterwards networks. So I'm going to, put, to get you through my analysis. And I said, what is, uh, what is so special about the Argentine RT, Red is the Trueque? It started in 1995, it exists today. You will find in some books, uh, some researchers say it disappeared with the crisis. Well, no, they just gave me the news that it's still around and they told me when and where. So it's still, it's a, it's a, it has had an, an evolution of more than 15 years by now. They used mostly printed currency, although there were some exceptions to this. There were at one point two and a half million users in the worst period of the economic crisis, 2001-2002. Uh, just to give you an idea of size, this is 20% of the economically active population. And to insist on this on scale, if you consider a full person family, two and a half million users would give you roughly uh, the size of of this, 10 million people survived or at least protected their lives and their lifestyles thanks to this other complementary currency. They were organized at the local, regional and national level. And this is also very interesting because the local ones are very similar to any other CCS anywhere, whereas the regional were already networks and therefore they could scale up pretty much. And the national, well, you could do 5,000 kilometers and still use your vouchers and to pay for uh, dental care and bread. And, well, they told me my bakery today with the, with the same voucher. One thing that is very important of, of why this was so big is that Argentina used to have a very strong middle class. At some point in the early 90s, there was a census and 75% of the population said they were middle class. So it's a country where there are so many people that have this middle class, class lifestyle, but not the income to sustain it. So this is one of the, uh, a very important reason why people were so open to finding new ways of protecting this. And the other thing that is very important is the presence of women, 70% of the members of women. This is what they looked like. This was just any market. Uh, this one in particular uh, functioned in uh, an abandoned factory. During the crisis, well, during the whole 90s, I would say, in Argentina, it wasn't difficult to find an abandoned factory that went past and so on. And many of them were occupied by people wanting to trade things. This is another example, another abandoned factory. And they used to trade a variety of things, usually uh, in small packages or things people had at home, uh, second-hand clothes. This is what they used for payment. And these are some examples of vouchers that they used. My favorite one is this one of the cat. Somebody loved his cat and put the image of his cat on the note. <laughs> And in the beginning, they were very amateurish banknotes, well, notes, vouchers. Uh, people making photocopies and cutting them with the scissors, literally. Uh, well, this is how you do something like that. Um, others looked a bit more professional. Some of them are 
you wonder how people were willing to do or give anything in return for this colored paper. Well, it was this or nothing, right? What I have found, I continue with the context of the case, is, like I said, a very strong presence of middle class. So you see, 60% of the members were owners of a home, so they had a capital to fall back on. 63% have taken holidays at least twice. Well, perhaps in the Netherlands this is not surprising, but in a developing countries, in a developing country, many people don't know what holidays are, and the idea of traveling elsewhere to go to the beach or to look at the sun for a bit of time uh, is totally outside their lives and their mindsets. 60% were internet users, and this, like I said, are data gathered almost 10 years ago in 2004, 2006, 2008 was the last time. So this has been progressively increasing, but this already speaks of a relatively well-educated kind of uh, profile of members. 43% of them were unemployed or had occasional work. That means a few days a week, usually, or some uh, a period of the year. 33, 32% of them were unpaid from workers, that is usually housewives. And the typical discourse I found is, I stopped working when I got married. But I love coming here because this is like work. And I recorded the same stories on and on again. This is like work. Uh, of course, women worked at home, but they didn't see it like that. Um, and the rest were basically low-income groups. Now, these markets, the CCS, used to work quite well when the poor were not more than, the poor I mean people who uh, were participating in the CCS to cover their most basic needs, food and basic clothing. When the, the presence of the poor was more than about a third of these CCS, then it ran in trouble because there wasn't just enough basic necessities redundant, but anyway, there weren't enough necessities to feed everybody. Uh, so this is also something that, in terms of scale, is very important. Okay, so this is what the RT in Argentina was like. And then I asked myself this question, and I asked the organizers this question. Why did you call it Barter Clubs? This is the name, the original name, before they went into the our team, no? the, the network part of the story. They created in 1995 something called Barter Club. This doesn't make any sense. There was never any bartering. There was money almost from three months after they started. In the beginning, they used to write in a piece of paper, A has given B X for Y amount. I said, why did you call it like this? And their answer was, well, we wanted to give the idea that participating in this scheme is based on work. Nothing is given. It's about trade. It's about people living on their own resources. Well, it's the idea of this self-help and self-reliance was behind it, although they probably didn't voice it in this way. And secondly, they said, we use the word club to give the impression that this is about solidarity or reciprocity. And then I asked myself, okay, so where is the market part? And this is where I'm starting, my, my starting point for this paper. I did a little bit of discourse analysis. What words were they using for what? And the reason why I did this is because, well, we know since Foucault that the words we use structure our action in a social sphere and establishes the mindset of the participants. Now, Let's redefine markets then. We can see markets as a social construction comprising a set of institutions that affect agents' behavior and coordinate their exchanges about price mechanisms. And the word price here is perhaps key because they said things have a price. And that's why we wanted to express that this is not about gift. People expecting gifts could go somewhere else. We, I said, well, okay, so which is the, the 
definition of institutions that fit best in this conception they had of markets. So one of rules of actions. They understood that what they were regulating was people's behavior in a social sphere. It's about rules, but in this very broad sense, not in a legal sense. And I found, then again, I kept on going back, so what do we know about market and market organizations? And of course it's a lot, but I'm going to focus on these three. Brodel, in the Wheels of Commerce, describes two types of markets, the public and the private markets. And he says, well, of course he's referring to medieval Europe, when he says that the merchants uh, sat down in obscure, he says something like obscure rule, uh, rooms to define the rules of exchange in the cities that had a market, and they found ways to exclude, well, of course he didn't use the word exclude, um, they found ways of setting rules that benefited them and keeping out the rest of buyers that would be interested and in this way they could keep prices up and so on and so on. Brodel has a, had a very, very negative uh, description of what he considered were the private markets. And the public markets were those that were accessible to everybody, in which presumably prices were competitive because there was regular supply and demand. Grave, afterwards, gives us a very similar account of how merchants created these, public, these private markets in a way that benefited their own interests. And he said, at the same time as they protect their interests, they go on creating their rules of exchange, the ways in which they think exchange best benefits them. And Coons, in more recent days, uses the word private markets for those that are uh, that targeting a restricted segment of buyers. For instance, uh, health insurance. We have a specific set of clients that are using the specific health services of this insurance. Now, then I ask myself, okay, so what are the regulation criteria? What is it that distinguishes a public from a private market in the literature of Brodel and so on? And using basic microeconomic wording in this case, I said, okay, well, it's the first one is exclusion. A private market seems to be those ones that can exclude buyers and sellers in the interests of those that are inside included. The second criterion would be rivalry. In a private market, if a person comes in, that would affect the situation of the others that are already included or inside or within. Whereas in a public market, an extra seller or an extra buyer, well, it just, just doesn't matter. And I'm not thinking of, I'm thinking of competitive markets, not of the Coca-Cola, Pepsi kind of monopoly markets. There is the idea that the ones inside can regulate the rules of participation by adding, um, well, like in an stock market, for example, that you have to buy a specific permit that allows you to trade in the stock market. So the ones within can set who, the rules of who is allowed to participate and who is not, and why. And usually this implies an entrance fee. But they can also decide on things like, well, um, when, to, when somebody will be punished or sanctioned for breaking a specific rule. Grave gives us the example that when a merchant would pay his or her debts, he would be sanctioned by the guild behind his merchants. And I thought, well, okay, so, and you might be wondering by now, where does all this historical account, uh, where is it going, where is the, uh, what did, has this got to do with CCS? I started asking, well, this is precisely, this fits very well into the idea of what the creators of the Renaissance Trek and the Clues and Trek had about their own markets. Uh, yeah. So, we have the idea precisely of a club. So if we distinguish between public markets, those open to everybody, there are no explicit rules of exclusion, 
there is no contribution for organizing. The market is out there. If you want to buy the bread that I'm presumably producing, you can just come and buy it. There is, no, uh, there is always some regulation by the state. In the case of food, they would regulate, I don't know, sanitation, for instance. I cannot have rats next to the food. Uh, like I said, no rivalry. And this is completely decentralized. There is no central decision maker of how much has to be produced, what's the price, and so on. <coughs> in a private market, in the sense of Rodel, we would find explicit exclusion. You have to be X to be able to trade in this market. Think, think of the stocks market again, you need an explicit permit. You usually contribute to its organization, that means you will spend some time and resources in going to meetings, at least. There is some internal regulation, for instance, uh, what's the price of the permit? There is rivalry, because an extra trader in the stock market means that everybody will have a smaller <coughs> share of the market. And usually there is a central body checking that people comply or abide by the rules. And this is the third possibility, that is somewhere in between, and this is where I place the CCS. It's interesting that Rolf was talking earlier about these uh, finite systems. A club is a finite system. I like, actually I like your framework more than mine at this point, but anyway. Um, a club market is the one that allows exclusion, and if we think in a CCS, the acceptance of the voucher in itself is an instrument of inclusion and exclusion. Or if we are including a business, a business that is willing to accept 50% of its sale in a complementary currency, this is, well, you said, uh, you said something like the, you have to travel to the hairdresser that is far away because the one next door won't accept this. This is a mechanism in itself of inclusion and exclusion. So, secondly, there is always a group that contributes time and resources to organize. And what is interesting of the club kind of framework is that this, is a, this core group is the one that seems to be uh, most interested, more motivated, and that of course is going to bear more, a, a larger share of the costs of this organization. Of course, that also means that they are going to be the ones yeah, that will take most of the decisions which in a club seems normal. Almost every club has a core, I don't know, a committee or something like that. That is the one that makes most of the decisions and the others just participate in the club. So this is also the idea of decentralization. This also allows me to reflect on the issue of scale. If a club is too small, it cannot maintain itself. And if it is too big, there will be uh, I forgot to put this one. Uh, there would be rivalry between the members. Think of a golf club. If we have a hundred people, everything is fine and we all enjoy it. You have more and more people at some point, nobody can play golf anymore. And this is also a problem of scale. It crowds up very quickly and then the organizational costs or transaction costs go up very quickly and the core group gets burned out. I think I'm, I'm using your words. It's, thanks very much. Um, well, and I leave it there because 30 seconds left. <laughs> but I'm still thinking of this, so if there are further ideas, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So, questions? Comments. Can I say one more thing? When Hamir was saying that he's seeing CCS as commons, uh, he also gave me an idea to, to, to have another look at this because clubs are also commons. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Regina, what happens when the. Well, the answer is obvious, but I want to know what happens when the, the size grows so much that start creating rivalry? What happened in Argentina? It was apart. But do, because for me, the obvious question is to break in two groups and make different meetings. Yeah, but you know that that is not, not always in practice. It's not always possible because you have the core group 
uh, will not want to give away half of its members and of participants, people will fight. I mean, this is very rational what you're saying, but well, as we know, in practice, people are not that rational. Well, this was also matter. proposed in Argentina, and there were all sorts of political, very it's strong a political of, fights. It's a matter of survival. It should be cooperation rather than competition. Well, and yes, it, it should, should be. be. <laughs> <laughs> Emphasis on the should, talking about these personalities. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. But, yeah. I would comment on the uh, idea of uh, clubs and uh, club markets. Mm. Um, I just wanted to point to Niklas Luhmann, uh, yeah. who, who made up the idea of uh, membership economies, uh, even with, without explicitly naming it like that, uh, what he described uh, concerning the, uh, the role of money, the role of currencies uh, for economic communication was exactly that. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I think that the uh, what, what you mentioned um, concerning a club, the, the the idea of club market or uh, being a commons or not. Uh, I've been at the commons conference uh, where exactly that issue was discussed and I believe um, that this is maybe a gradual uh, distinction. So uh, depending on how the institutionalized the, the borders are designed, you can, talk, you can talk of a club or of a commons. So I think there's gradual Okay, that, that's a very useful column. Thanks very much. Actually, you can find CCS in all the three columns. You find CCS that are like very much similar to public markets. <coughs> you find CCS that are very similar to private. Well, I mean, each time we fly and we get miles, and these miles we can only use it to purchase flights within the same company, we are creating a private market. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, and the ones about Chippewa were clubs, or work like clubs. So. Yeah, that's interesting. Thanks. Mm, exactly, especially concerning the public markets, the complementary currencies that are discussed now for, for public markets are parallel currencies for the Eurozone, for example, yeah. uh, which are uh, which fit perfectly into your public market yeah. category. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure about the organization of tradition and regulation by state and revival. Somewhat being you know, criterions, uh, if you if you put uh, a parallel currency such as um, uh, express, uh, express good. Good. yeah, um, I'm not sure that would fit in the public market idea of decentralization. Yeah. There would be a lot more questions about that. You have to think about it because you, you you would have many more stakeholders uh, involved. The, in the public market as uh, defined, it's, it's, a space, yeah. it's a space very limited. If you go national and put the power of currency in that way, um, you have the own stakeholders, very different, uh, and uh, multinationals, for example, uh, using uh, also uh, the with, uh, headquarters inside the country, etc. So there would be more interpreting inter inter yeah. <laughs> for. Uh, such a nice life, and 
my fridge was always full, using the words. And this is what is happening now, when people say it, it, it disappeared. But actually it didn't disappear, it's simply stagnant and it still exists. This happened at the same time as the economic recovery. So your question is whether this is anti-cyclical or not, I think. Mm. Uh, yes, but you still have to, to, to explain a lot of uh, residue, a lot of uh, years and, and, and behavior in the trend that do not correspond with uh, an anti-cyclical behavior. In some years it was the, the regular economic group and this group, and in other years, the opposite happened. One, uh, the economy went down and this grew. So, uh, no, there isn't such perfect correlation, in fact. This is not a child of the crisis. No, remember what I said, it's a But are we still using the, the quick game? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's what I told you. They just told me when and where to see it. So, it still exists. Yeah. 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 About, about the main chosen, uh, that is the uh, toy quick. Um, about it. Um, maybe I, I have another word. explanation because uh, when I talk about uh, complementary currency to people who don't know anything about it, uh, they just say, but uh, is it barter? So for them, there is official money and barter and nothing else. So maybe that's why at the beginning they talked about barter. Yes, uh, yeah, well, yes, you're basically right. They, they didn't want to talk about money and markets, so they say, oh, we call it tricky, a barter. But there was never, like I said, any direct barter or payments in kind. Why don't you see a rivalry in a public market? Uh, I specifically said I'm thinking of competitive markets and not the monopolized markets. This is not Coca-Cola versus Pepsi. I'm thinking about the thousands of bakeries that you can find in any city. But if I, for example, am a seller or producer and I'm coming into this market, it's right, right for it. Uh, Why not? Yeah. Additional competition. I mean, if there's a bakery here, you would not set your bakery 50 meters away. Why not? Unless there is a very good reason why you would do it, but otherwise you go to a place where, where there are no bakeries. Why not? I can offer lower prices to make competition. It's what every day happens in a public market. So there is more competition, I think, as in a private market or as in a public market. Then, so it, uh, maybe it's based on the definition of ri it's a rivalry. Yeah. Uh, okay, yes, it's based on the definition that I am using for public market. Yes. True. Yeah. Um, this might be a technical question, but uh, I'm not very sure about the connection between the uh, private, uh, public, and the club market and the public, private, club goods. So I am very familiar with the public goods and public uh, uh, club goods. Yeah. But uh, I'm not really sure about the. Uh, uh, you know, those markets, so is there any connection between them or uh, really different concepts? No, no, it's very similar. Mm -hmm. It's, it's or, trans uh, yeah. yeah. It's transferred. The, the the, the, those are form of the same. Uh, the private market, private, uh, uh, public market are almost the private goods or private yeah. yeah, the distinction is transferred. Yeah, pretty much uh, what you know of public, private, and club goods is transferred into markets. Yeah. Why do you say about market rather than good? I mean, uh, if there is a public good, you know, it becomes like a part everybody can use. Is that no, because these are markets. These are places where people, not necessarily physical, uh -huh. uh, where people exchange. So what this framework is looking at is who is exchanging what, with what, with which rules, and so on. So that means that uh, the market itself is a kind of goods or services? You are using a service, yes. That's exactly the assumption. Mm -hmm. That you use exchange as a service that you uh, produce and consume in collectively with others. Exactly. Last question? Yes, I would like to know whether the um, failure of 
Because if you have this uh, idea that, oh, it's because the rest of the economy was doing so badly that people jumped in here, uh, then you would have to explain a lot of other things that your explanation doesn't cover. But, second, question, do you think that that may happen with like Bankia and other places as well, like Cypher recently? They would have a but Bankia and Cyprus, he's oh, mentioned. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I don't hear Bankia you very well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. May that happen again? The Coralito, you know how to translate that well, the failure of banks? Uh, I think Argentina had a combination of a few things. Uh, the disenfranchised middle class, which Cyprus has, the weakness of the welfare state. I'm not sure if Cyprus fits there. The strength of the civil society, I mean, Argenti uh, the Argentine society is used to self-organizing lots of things. I'm not sure about Cyprus there. The presence of women, definitely, women that wanted to work outside. Uh, so you have several conditions that led to this and that are not just the crisis in the regular economy. Mm -hmm. So some of these conditions apply to Cyprus and I'm not so sure about others. Uh, in any case, I don't have the crystal ball, so I probably cannot answer that question. Just the very last question because we have to go to lunch. Good lunch. You very quickly. Yes. Uh, what do you think um, is most important to improve the system for the future? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have. You will have lunch with Georgina. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's. It. I can. So it's a very long answer. Okay.